European leaders, this is the Palais de l'Elysée, the home of President Macron, along with the medical and the scientific community, have been countering COVID-19 by taking critical decisions based on the science, based on the data, their own healthcare capacities and their own economies. What's also come to light is the COVID-19 issue is as much social as it is scientific. Professor Vladimir Kirchmeri, who I spoke with at length, is a Slovak epidemiologist who also chaired his own country's COVID-19 task force. Here's what he had to say. Where I'm talking to you from now is, is a homeless shelter that you've actually set up for the homeless in order to treat those that have COVID-19. Where did the idea for this come about and why did you do that? We took all homeless people from Bratislava who were uh, more than six, were 65 and older. So we, we, we select them, we took them from a the street and give them some incentives. So three times f free food, free cigarettes, but they cannot leave the shelter. They have to stay the shelter in a complete lockdown, which, which was one month, the worst time. One. So, so this is again very easy. You take the vulnerable population, you, you, you put them in a lockdown, you call it, for example, Life Island, you use incentives to attract them. And we had no one single COVID in this type of population, which is known to be very vulnerable and very transmissible. How many people are you treating at your shelter? And now there are maybe 30 people here because we, we, have, we have a good situation. We have 20 new cases in the whole country and two in Bratislava. So it's no reason now to... So they can now go free to, to make a shopping and do other things. And we are going to close the shelter when the situation will be really good. I'd love to just learn a little bit more about uh, your experiences in Africa, especially with Ebola. I have seen Ebola only once in my life when I was in South Sudan, which was uh, 20 years ago. In the, the, we stopped the disease in the village, uh, not with uh, the, the, the medicine or health. Or because the vaccines were not available in that time, uh, we asked the local police to stop the funeral ceremony. So the local police, they just dissolved the people they were do, willing to do the funeral of the, of the died person. In the, uh, what they did, and they dissolved the ceremony, and uh, this was how they stopped the Ebola in that village. If you live with the people and you know their habits, then you can understand the transmission procedure. What lessons did you learn from working with Ebola in South Sudan? Uh, and how did you apply them to your approach to COVID-19 in Slovakia? In countries which it's a low adherence to authority, which was the case of three Ebola countries, yeah, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, uh, one, of the, one of the problems was that the adherence of the people to the decision of the authorities was uh, was uh, was low, yeah. So so and it's similar in 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 uh, in COVID in countries where the adherence to the government and the, the the confidence to the government and the discipline is lower, then the spread is easier. If the if the 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 the, the, the phenomenon of freedom and if the principle of freedom and uh, human rights is higher than the fear of the dead. And it's very difficult to do anything concerning the epidemic. Professor, I'm, I'm going to share my screen with you. I want to share with you the, the curve for Slovakia. And it's, it's accurate as of July the 16th. Uh, and the data is from the John Hopkins website. Now, Slovakia's curve is green, which means that it's been very effective. What were the key aspects that you imparted to the government, to the people, in order to persuade them that this was the approach that you should take with the virus? I think the crucial was uh, early action. Early action, we were the first country in all Europe which closed the airport in, in Bratislava. Uh, in all airports, sorry, all airports in the country. Even we did that uh, just, uh, they, we announced the closure of the airport the day when we had the first case. Second thing was that we closed the uh, student guest houses even one day before the disease appeared. So the universities dissolved the guest houses because I've seen in Hong Kong in 2003 how bad it is when you have to quarantine a student guest house. 
and and there there are seventy thousand students who were in that house. Uh, and we we were in time where there was end of holiday and the people were coming from Italy, and then Italy was already ten days full blown disease. So we 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 did those first things: the closed airport, including all the flights from Italy. Then they solved the guest houses that was done by the union. The government did also a very important thing that they blocked, they closed the border. Not completely, uh, the border was closed and the people were asked to go to the quarantine when we were coming from Austria. And it was, it was not a forced quarantine. A very important thing was the introduction of forced quarantine, which came two weeks after the closure of the border. That means the people not going voluntarily to the quarantine to their home, and they were going to the forced quarantine to the hotels and the guest houses, which were organized by the state and and tested. The, the number four, what I think was important, that the government start massive testing. Uh, we started with 200 tests per day uh, on day, day first, and after one week, we did 6,000 tests per day. So, so the massive testing, the closure of the border, uh, the, the, the early uh, closure of the airport, and the early dissolution of the student guest houses. And I, I, I underline the word early. We, we were not willing, if we, if we were willing to avoid a complete lockdown, then we have to do the partial lockdowns very early. So we did this. Even some of those measurements were done one or two days before the first case came. We were not waiting until they were be two. When was that? When, when was the first case? What, what timeline are you talking? The first about? case was on the seventh uh, March, and the the, the, the the universities were closed in a on a second March. In the, the the guest houses were all emptied on the fifth March. In the, the airport was closed uh, on uh, well, the announcement of the closure of the airport was on the sixth of March. I remember those days because I was a part of the committee which was uh, trying to pursue the, the government, and I I have to admire the government that despite they didn't understand us and they didn't agree maybe in, in their depth, they, they accepted our advice. What is our expectation or should our expectation be for COVID-19? Even when there is a vaccine, should we still expect the kind of example that we see with tuberculosis in that, in that we will have to live with COVID-19 for the rest of our lives? And irrespective of whether there's a vaccine or not, people will always succumb. Uh, we have several good examples from uh, epidemiology that the vaccines work and work effectively. If you look to the history, you mentioned TB. Yes, that's true. Uh, the mortality on TB is 1.7 million people every year died on TB, and nobody cares. I think bringing a COVID vaccine will be a major event combating the disease. And there is also a question if, uh, if uh, the young generation or young people or those they don't like vaccines will refuse. The, 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 the science and health and medical community is credible because it's showing examples of at least 10 diseases which were eradicated. Now, you may give me a question, why still the TB is a problem despite we have a vaccine? It's true, we have vaccine. But this my, is- My not question, Professor, would be, clearly something else needs to happen over and above a vaccine. What is that? It's not just about a silver bullet, which is a vaccine. Yes, that's correct. Uh, uh, we have to we have to have good argumentation. Those arguments to the public, uh, we, we have to show them those good examples that we saved maybe thirty million people with with uh, with with this rapid intervention because it's much easier to convince the people who have higher trust and discipline to to the healthcare system than uh, societies which are subject of uh, the anti-vaccine and anti-science groups, of course. So uh, uh, we have to be maybe more credible and to give more data and try to pursue the people uh, to tell them that, uh, look to the history. We have clear examples with a good effect of vaccination to millions and millions of people with, with 
dramatic decrease of mortality. Professor, thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. God bless you. All the best. All the you best.